Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Pathfinders, happy Sabbath. Looking good. I remember getting up in the morning and trying to get that twirl on my scarf right. You guys are twirled up well. Um, as we get started, let's, let's pray together, and uh, we'll get into our, our message. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Sabbath, for church, family, community, for something so wonderful as Pathfinders, where we get a chance to grow together, and we get to learn together, and um, we get to become and develop the, into these people that you want us to be. Uh, help us today as we spend some time reflecting on what it means to trust in you and all of the other blessings that you have for us on this Sabbath day. We open ourselves, all of our senses, our minds, our eyes, our ears, our nose, our hearts, even our tongues, because you say, taste and see that you are good. So this morning, we ask that you give us that blessing. In your name we pray, amen. My family and I love going on walks. When we lived in Korea, um, uh, and, and, and Sister Jill, you can attest to this, um, everybody goes on walks. It doesn't matter if it's 10 in the morning or 10 at night. There are people all over the park just walking. Some of them are really fancy. They even wear gloves and hats, and they have walking clubs. And you'll see the, the old ladies in their, in, their, in their gear, you know, kind of like you guys are in uniform. They have their uniform as well, and they're just walking through. And so that's something that we as a family have learned to do. We like to walk. And just particularly this week, we were walking, and... We got to the gate close to the, the university, and uh, my, my daughter says, Mom, I want to play trust game. And she says, okay, okay, you, you stand there, and um, you say, I trust you, and you fall back. And so my wife is standing there, getting ready, and uh, my, my daughter, Shannon, she goes, I trust you, and she falls back. Unfortunately, there was a space that was not quite calculated, and therefore, my wife's hands are here, and my daughter is on the ground. And she's laughing, and she says, Mommy, and she says, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, let's do it again. I said, Mm-mm, I would not do it again. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't trust if that situation happens. Now, I've done that before with my son as well. I tried to, you know, pick him and misjudge it. So it's, it's, it's not, this is not just a bag on my wife. You know, we've we both done it. But in light of that, I want to talk to us today about trust. There is a difference between how we understand things, how we gauge things, and how God gauges things. Um, I have learned this growing up. And you know, I just talked here about you guys as pathfinders and you're developing and you're, you're, you're growing up. You'll have all kinds of experiences. Anybody in high school yet? Yeah, what grade? Ninth, Ninth grade, how about you? Eleventh grade, how about you? Ninth, Ninth? okay, all right. So, so right during that, that period, all right? So you're, you're, you are now in the eleventh grade, or are you gonna be a senior? You're going to, oh, look at that smile. See, when, when they have that, I'm going to be a senior, right? So my senior year, I went to a, I'm an, an academy called Rio Lindo Academy in Northern California. Beautiful school. Oh, yes, yes, beautiful school. And, uh, and I had a friend who, who was always trying to find, you know, the best ways to do something, right? Uh, what's the easiest way that we can get an A? That, that was his thing. And so he comes to me one day, he's like, Donovan, I got a plan, I got a plan. Here is how we can finish. It's our last quarter of school, and I have a class that we can take that's a guaranteed A. And I said, okay, well, what class is that? He says, drama. 
And I'm like, drama? What, what do you mean drama? Those are like all the kids that are like very emotional and they're kind of like, you know, I don't know. I'm not sure about that, you know? And, uh, and he says, no, come on. We got to do this. Look, all we got to do is sit in the class, maybe scream once, maybe cry once, you know, whatever. Just sit there and just do whatever happens in the class. It's like a participation grade. You know, like you get those trophies for participation He's like, dude, we're going to get a participation trophy here, all right? But it's an A. It's easy. Let's do it. I thought about it. I said, okay, all right, fine. Let's go. Let's join this class. So we go to the class. We get there in the class. And, you know, they're having us do all kinds of act like a tree, act like an apple, I don't know, all kinds of different stuff. And we come to the end of the quarter, and I'm like, wow. This is true, like we really didn't do anything and we're about to get an A, this is awesome, good job. And then the teacher stands up and says to us, I have a final that I want to give you. And I'm like, okay, it can't be that hard, we didn't do anything. Um, And she says to us, here's the final. I am going to put on a play at the the, uh, academy. And you don't necessarily have to be in the play, but everybody in this drama class must audition for the play. And I'm like, oh, that means reading. That means maybe memorizing something. That means getting up in front of people and acting. Oh, man, I do not want to do this. I thought you said we were going to get an A for doing nothing. He said, sorry, man, I didn't know. I'm like, I know you didn't know. So, you know, we get there, and she gives us our scheduled times. And this is a play called, if any of you guys, if you guys have been in English, maybe you've heard of this play. It's a play called The Crucible, right? It's by an author author named Arthur Miller, and it's about the Salem witch trials, right? And um, the, the, the plot of the story is there's this, you know, these people that they, they, uh, they think they're witches or they accuse them of being witches and then they basically execute them because they are thought to be a witch, all right? Uh, great bedtime story. Just talk, talk with your parents. It'll, it'll be lovely, all right? So that was the play we were doing. And so we come, and I go to my audition, and I said, okay, look, she just said we have to audition. She didn't say we're going to be in the play. She didn't say that's going to be part of it. I'm just going to go in here, give the worst audition of my life, but, you know, look like I'm really trying. This will be the first time I do some acting for this actual class, right? So I go there, I do my terrible audition, and the teacher is just riveted for some reason. I think it's because she didn't have enough people for her play, but she was trying to be kind of encouraging, right? She says, wow, that was wonderful. You got the part. And I was like, what? No, 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 no. No, I didn't, no, I didn't, I didn't get the part. She says, yes, that was wonderful. You got the part. And I'm like, okay, um, what, what part do you want me to play? And she goes, there's, a, there's this a character in there. His name is John Proctor. I want you to, to go and read the lines, and, um, and, and that's the part you're going to do. So I'm like, all right, John Proctor, whoever. Who's this guy, John Proctor? Maybe he has, like, he's a farmer. He has, like, a line. Like, they're over there or something like that, right? So I start reading this, and I see John Proctor's name a lot. <laughs> and I'm like, this whole page is, is, is one other person in John Proctor. And it and, and dawned on me that this guy is one of the main people. He's the main guy in this, in this play. And I said, are you serious? I can't believe this. I was trying to get an easy A, and now I have to do a play. I did not know. I was unsure of my plans at that time. That was not the part of the future that I had planned. But I found myself in the situation. So time goes on, there, you know, we're doing all of the, the, the various rehearsals and stuff. I am skipping the rehearsals because I really don't want to do this play. And my teacher, you know, she's hanging out of trees, grabbing me up and trying to bring me to rehearsal. She's tracking me down in the dorm. She's like, hey, we've got rehearsal tonight. You come in? I'm like, uh, I guess so. You saw me, so I'll come. So about two weeks before the play, I actually start going to these rehearsals. And I start, you know reading the lines and everything, still kind of not taking it too seriously. But my teacher is like, she's very dramatic. She is like, be the tree. 
be the forest. Have you ever been to the forest? Sure. You've been there. You know what it's like. Be the fort. You know, this is like my, this is my drama teacher, right? And so she's really like extra into everything. And, 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 and I'm sitting there and, and I'm not feeling this at all. So we come to this very dramatic scene, right? There's a scene between um, John Proctor and this servant girl who he's had a relationship with. Um, and it's, and it's, it's, um, it's not a good relationship because he's married, so he shouldn't have a relationship with this girl, but they have had this relationship. And so there's a scene where they're talking, and John Proctor gets really mad at this girl, and he goes and he grabs the girl, and he you know, tells her something, and the girl's response that she's grabbed is, she knows, talking about how his wife knows about their relationship. So, you know, I'm going through, and I'm grabbing her, and I'm like, do what I say, or whatever the line is, you know? And the girl goes, she knows. And I, you know, let her go, and I look at the director, and I'm like, okay, what's next? She's like, no, 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 no. That's the most shocking news. Have you ever been shocked? Have you ever been shocked? Have you ever been shocked in the forest? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. Joking. But so, 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 so anyway, so she's like, no, no, you've got to, you, you, you got to be shocked. You can't, you can't, you can't just, just let her go like that. This is the, this is the reveal. This is the big shocking thing. She says, here's what I want you to do. And then she goes into like drama trance. And she's like, I want you to grab her. And she's going to say, she knows. And you're going to release her. And you're going to step back three times with a shocking face. I'm like, all right, grab her, release her, shocking face, whatever. <laughs> and so we go and we do the scene again. You gotta help me, you, you're, you're, just, you're just two here, okay? <laughs> you gotta help me, all right? So I'm gonna grab your arms and you're just gonna shout out, she knows, okay? So I go, grab, do what I say. She knows. <laughs> perfect, perfect. She knows. And then, so, and then so, you know, I'm still like not very much caring about this, so I go, grab her, release her, one, two, three, shock, all right? And the teacher's like disappointed with me. She's like, all right, we'll do it again tomorrow. We'll do it again tomorrow. All right, let's give him a hand. Thank you for helping. <laughs> so finally we go through rehearse, and it comes to the night of the play. And I guess this is the first time they've done a play there for a while, but, you know, everybody's parents are there, all the other students, and even some people from the conference came, and, you know, our, our director decided not to tell us that until right before we got on. She says, okay, guys, this is it. This is it. We've got all these people here. You've got to just give it your best. Just give it your all. I'm like, all right, let her go. Three steps back, shock on the face. I just got to remember that, right? So we go through the play, we're doing it, everything's happening, whatever. Then we get to this dramatic scene, and I go up to the girl and I say, do what I tell you. That's right, you're right. She says, she knows. And you know, in my mind, all I knew is, let her go, three steps back, look shocked. So when I grab her and she goes, she knows, in the audience they go, <gasps> And then I really was shocked. <laughs> but I wasn't shocked at the situation here. I wanted to break my character and say, you guys actually believe, you know this is a play, right? She doesn't know anything. There's nothing to know. But actually through that experience, I started to like acting. I said, man, this is, this is kind of interesting. All of these people come and get involved in this situation and they start to emotionally take part of it. I kind of like doing this. And so as I went to college, I started to do plays. The first play I ever did when I went to La Sierra University was a play by William Shakespeare called Othello. And guess who I got to be? <laughs> Othello, right? Never read Shakespeare before in my life, and I'm doing Othello. Awesome, it was fun, and I continued to do that. I was in a play every single quarter that I was at La Sierra University. And um, that, that was uh, something that I had never imagined, that something I had never planned to do, something that I thought, you know, I'm just trying to get an easy A. However, that became a big part of 
who I turn out to be. So I had decided that I want to go into plays. I want to write plays. I want to act. And when I was at La Sierra University, I got a chance to write plays. I got a chance to write a week-long Easter pageant and all of these different things. And, and, and I remember one year, because I had been so uh, well-known with plays, there was a, a, um, a drama group on campus that um, they were getting ready to do this tour, and they were going to go to Australia and do this tour. So they said, hey, we would like for you to audition for our, um, for our troupe. So I go and I audition for them, and they start telling me about the, the Australia trip, and they say, yeah, it's going to be this summer, so I don't know if you live close or if you live far, but if you are, you know, come back and, and we'll get everything ready. So finally, it's time. I come to school, you know, earlier than I usually do, probably about a month earlier so I can get ready and go on this tour, right? And I'm looking for the guys, and, you know, I, I don't see them. So I call them, and I'm trying to get them on the phone, and no answer. Randomly, I run into him about two weeks or so before, and I ask him, hey, so how's everything going, getting ready for the, the tour? He says, yeah, yeah. And I said, you know, how's all the plans and everything? And he says, they're fine. He says, and he says yeah, we're, we're getting ready, and here's who's going. And he lists off the people, and he doesn't say my name. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. I came from summer break early so I could do this play, so I could go with you guys on this tour. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I don't enjoy cutting off my summer break early. Do you, anybody, anybody like, anybody like, yeah, I'm back in school, yes. <laughs> yeah, a, a verbal no, a verbal no, right? So when I heard this, it was quite devastating to me. Anyway, I didn't say anything to the guy, I let him leave. My mom calls me. And I guess she can tell I'm not feeling so well. And she says, how's it going, Don? And I said, uh, I got some bad news about this Australia trip. She says, what's wrong? What's the problem? What's going on? I said, yeah, I guess I'm not going to be going. She says, oh, wonderful. I said, wait, um, no, no, no. I said, I'm not going to be going. Good, good. Mom, I'm thinking my mom's deaf now. You know, I said, no, the whole reason I came back here early to go to was to go to Australia, but now I'm not going. Why are you happy? She says, because I just found out about this acting class. Now, some of you guys may know this. How many of you know the, the TV show Magnum P.I.? Anybody ever heard of that show? All right, some people. Yes, good, good, good. All right, all right. So Magnum P.I., it's this awesome show. It's just, you Google it. It's awesome, okay? Um, but anyway, there was, a, there was a guy on that show and uh, he was teaching an acting class that was, that was near to where I was. And so my mom said, yeah, I know this guy who runs this acting school, and, and this guy's teaching the class, and now because you didn't go to Australia, you can go and you can take this class. And I was like, uh, I don't have any money. She says, yeah, no, I've saved up money. I'm going to pay for it for you so you can go and take this acting class with this famous actor. I'm like, what? Good, yes, yes, awesome, good. And so I got a chance to take this class, even though I thought it was the worst time, it was actually the best time, because that opened up a whole bunch of other opportunities for me. Once I, I, I got back from uh, Korea, I, I was able to do all these commercials. I was in a LeBron James commercial. I've been on CSI New York and CSI Miami and all these things, just because of some of those opportunities that I got, things that I thought I would never get in life. Those were not part of my plans. Those were not things that I felt would be part of my future. Yet, because of how things worked out, they were. Now, I want to transition to our verses here. We've read these two verses, one that I'm sure is extremely familiar to you. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord plans to give you hope, plans to give you a, a, a bright future. But I want to tell you a little bit of the background behind that story. I don't know how many of you have ever gone through, have any of you read the book of Jeremiah before? Yeah? And it's very interesting because the, 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 the situation just before you get to that verse 
you have, there's these two prophets. One guy's name is Jeremiah. Another guy's name is Hananiah. And they're there, and they're in the king's court, right? They're, they're sad, they're distressed, because all of their people have been taken as, as prisoners of war. And they're there in Babylon. So they're, they're no longer there in Israel in their homeland. You know, I don't know if you could imagine what it would be like if, you were, if we were invaded by another country and you're just taken away from America and you have to go live somewhere else and you have no idea that you're going to be coming back home. You may never see your family again. This is the situation going on. But for some reason, there's this prophet, Hananiah, who comes, and he has this wonderful prophecy for the people, right? Jeremiah has just come in, and he's had these big wooden yokes that he's put on himself, you know, these kind of shackle things. Or maybe you might, you might have seen something like it in an in a old uh, <coughs> Western movie, where there's a guy, he's kind of got his head there, and he's got his arms there, he's sort of locked up, right? So Jeremiah comes, he's got one of these big things on. He comes in and he tells the people that they're going to be in captivity. It's going to happen for a while. But then this guy, Hananiah, comes up. And he goes before the people. He says, people, do not worry. I'm paraphrasing here. It's going to be okay. He goes up to Jeremiah, who's got these stocks on, and he breaks it. Pow! Breaks the stocks off. And he says, just as I have broken the stocks off of Jeremiah, the Lord will break the stocks off off of our people. We will receive everything that we have lost and our people are going to come back in two years. Good news for the people. Wow, awesome, awesome, yeah. Unfortunately, this was not the truth. This was not the truth. Jeremiah comes to that prophet and says, hey, I don't know where you're getting these words, but those words did not come from God. That is not what God says. And because you have lied to God's people and gotten God's people excited about a lie, God's going to remove you from the face of the earth. And that situation gets dealt with. But Jeremiah writes a letter. And he gives it to some messengers. He says, I want you to go to all of our people in Babylon, I want you to deliver this letter to them. And he delivers this letter to the people of Israel who have been taken away from their home that now they, they have to live there in Babylon. These people who have gotten so excited about this information, in two years we're going home, wow, what a wonderful time, it's going to be awesome, you know? They're pretty sure that this is what their future is going to be, back home, back as they planned it. But in the letter, it actually says this. You guys need to stay comfortable right where you are. In the cities where you are, get jobs, make a living, start your families, live your life in that situation. Pray for the city, because when the city is blessed, that's when you'll be blessed. Do what you can to make the city good because that's how your life is going to be good. You're not coming back here. You are to live your life as it is now. But don't worry. Because I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Now, I'm not sure if you knew the context of that, but that sounds quite a bit different than how we may present it. A lot of times, we look at that verse and, and we say, God has these wonderful things in store for me, and it's going to happen, and, and I know and I understand this is how my life is going to pan out. It's going to be wonderful, yes. But we never think about our situation. We never think about, maybe I have misunderstood how God's going to work this thing out. Maybe I am not actually going to get the, the big house, or maybe I'm not actually going to, to, to have all this kind of fantasy life, right? All those situations I just told you guys about my life and how they worked out well, yeah, they worked out well, but I didn't even know that until after it was all over. 
I didn't know that until looking back at the situation. But the question we have to ask, and the thing that you have to start to learn now as young people, as you're developing now, is how do you live life when you're uncertain about the future? We've all had times where we feel that way. We've all had times where there's a a certain thing that happens in our lives, and we are not sure how that is going to pan out. I don't know how many of you have been experiencing or have been, uh, or have friends that maybe have been a part of this, this, this fire that has been happening. Um, I, how far are they with containing that? Is it, is it taken care of now? Is it, it's done? Okay. But in that situation, when people had to evacuate their houses, when people weren't sure if they were going to go back to their home, maybe some people even had loss in there. Those are the times when you have to ask this question, is it true that God has a bright future for me? Is it true that even though I find myself in this situation, that my future is, is, is something that I have to hope for? Those are the times when you have to ask yourself, is God really real? Or is God like this idea that we hear in our Sabbath school and Bible studies? Because at those times, we need to be able to hold on to a God that is just as real as the situation we find ourselves in. And those times we need to to have a promise that will help us to get through uncertainty. I want to share something with you. Let me see if they have it in this version. I like this book. The Message Bible. It's a, it's a paraphrase, but it's, it speaks to us in like a very natural hour times kind of kind of tone, all right? Um, and I want to read to you Jeremiah 29, all right? It says, this is a letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to what was left of the elders among the exiles to the priests and prophets and the exiles. It says, this is the message from God of the angel armies of Israel. God, to all of the exiles, I have taken from Jerusalem and Babylon. It says, build houses, make yourselves at home, put in gardens, eat what grows in that country, marry and have children, encourage your children to marry and have children so that you'll thrive in that country and not waste away. Make yourselves at home there and work for the country's welfare. Pray for the Babylonians' well-being. If things go well with Babylon, things will go well with you. Yes, believe it or not, this is the message from God of the angel armies of Israel. Don't let all those so-called preachers and know-it-alls who are all over the place there take you in with their lies, right? Remember they were saying they were gonna, they were gonna be there for, and, and be freed after two years. Said, don't, don't believe that, right? Don't let them take you in there with their lies. Don't pay attention to that fantasy they keep coming up with to please you. They're a bunch of liars, preaching lies and claiming all I've sent them. I've never sent them, believe them not. This is God's word. As soon as Babylon's 70 years are up, and not a day before, I'll show up and take care of you as I promised and bring you back home. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not to abandon you, Plans to give you the future you hope for. And then, here's a verse that we often forget. Verse, the next verse, it says, When you call on me, when you come and pray to me, I'll listen. When you come looking for me, you'll find me. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. God's decree. So here is what I want you to know. There are times where everything doesn't go 
as planned. There are times when things don't look like the fantasies that we have. There are times where we find ourselves in a situation that is difficult, that is very real, that we can't see past. But that's where our second verse comes in. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct our paths. In those times where we're not sure about the future, it says don't trust in ourselves. Don't look at the way we see things because there's something more. This is good news. Don't look at the way we see life because there's something more. I don't know about you guys in Santa Clarita, but that makes me feel very happy when life is more than I see it to be. This is the promise that God gives to us, and the sooner you learn this, the better. The sooner you get this into your, into your being and, and, and into the way you live life, the better your life is going to be. Because there will be many times where you find disappointments. There will be many times where, you th- where things don't work out the way that you plan them to be. But always know that what you see is not all there is. What you see is only how we understand them to be. And those times we fall short like the trust fall. But God's arms are long enough. And God's ideas are big enough. And our job is to follow and to stick with him. I think that the message we find here is that God is saying, no matter what the situation, I want you to stick with me. I want you to stick with it. You guys um, talked this year at, at a couple of your meetings. You guys talked about prayer, and you guys talked about the, the armor of God, right? And, and I was looking at that this morning, and, and I just want to finish off with a couple of things from that, that passage, right? Um, that's found in, 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 in Ephesians chapter 6. Verses 10 through 18. I want to read it to you from the Message Bible. It's awesome, right? This is what it says. And that about wraps it up. This is, he's finishing up the letter now. He says, God is strong, and he wants you strong. So take everything the Master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use so you will be able to stand to everything the devil throws your way. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we, that we will walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. Right? Life is not something you just experience for a second and then you go back to the fantasy. No, it's the other way around. Right? It says, this is for keeps. A life and death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued so that when it's all over, but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's world is an indispensable weapon. God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard, pray long, pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops off. And don't forget to pray for me. Prayer And trust in God go hand in hand. So what I want you to know is when you see these verses, especially this Jeremiah 29, 11 verse, remember that the people received that message in a time that was not the best for them. They received that message during a time when it was difficult. But the message was to trust God and to keep going, not to give up, not to whine and cry, 
but to continue to live life knowing that God will support us, knowing that God will be with us, knowing that in our uncertainty, God continues to guide us at all places. And we have to live life with this confidence, knowing that what we see is not all there is. There's much more, right? God says, I came to give you life and and give you life to the fullest. So in all situations, God is going to do what it takes to give you the best that you have in life. As young people, as pathfinders, as you're developing and you're growing in your Christian relationship and, and the world around you, please make this part of your life. Please make this something that you hold and we'll find times where you may have friends that aren't in this same situation that don't have the same understanding, and that's a time for you to be able to share something that's hopeful for them. This is the awesome thing about God. Once you get it, you can share it. Repeat that after me. Once I get it, I can share it. Once I get it, I can share it. Let's do that all, church. Once I get it, I can share it. Yes, so I hope this is, this is my prayer for each and every one of us here in this community, for you and your own individual um, relationships with others. You get a chance to be a partner with God. You get a chance to share this, this confidence, this joy, this hope, which really is a bright future, which really is a plan for us to prosper, even in the times when we don't see that it's a possibility. It's all possible through God. So this is my prayer, this is what I, what I hope you celebrate, and this is the joy that I hope you continue to have um, as you go through your life, as you continue to develop as young people, and as we as a church continue to support each other and, and grow um, our young people and our faith and connect with our community around us. What we see is not all there is, because God has more. Amen. Amen.